we heard some commotion, and I turned and looked, and this guy had come in, and he had grenades strapped to his chest. I had to leave everything that I knew, my brothers, my parents, my friends. And at the age of nine, I came to the United States by myself. I remember battling, wanting to be a mom and wanting to carry my child, but if I said yes to the adoption route, I wasn't gonna get that. Pandemic is here, I don't have a job, can't work yet. My contingency plan for contingency plan as well went up in smoke. It was very, very smoky and smoggy in there and screaming. And I'm laying on the ground, and he comes over and he goes, where's Samuel? Can't see Samuel. When you get to a place where you trust in God and you give that brokenness over to God, he'll take something that's broken and make it beautiful. Yes, God called the Wombo family to forsake all and trust him in Pakistan. But he's calling all of us to do that daily. If we call ourselves Christians and we don't do anything to help, we're going to do it. We're just going to do it. Well, good morning, Bell Shoals family. My name is Corey Abney, and I serve as the lead pastor. And so glad to have you with us here at the Brandon campus. And those of you who are joining us online, this is a special day in the life of our faith family because we are celebrating some difference makers. And you know, one of the things that I love most about Bell Shoals is that we've really always been a faith family that is seeking to make a difference in the world. We, we've always been a faith family that have raised up men and women that are seeking to make a difference for King Jesus all around the world. And, and, and I believe with all of my heart that one of the reasons God has so richly blessed our faith family over the years, because we are so deeply committed to making much of Jesus throughout the entire world. That's why we do what we do. If you're new to Bell Shoals today, I want you to know we are here to give honor and praise and glory to Christ and Christ alone. We, we believe with all of our hearts, yes. We believe with all of our hearts that there is nothing better in all the world than knowing Jesus and living for Jesus. There's truly nothing better in all the world. And, and, and we've seen throughout the years, really, I mean, for 2,000 years now, when you think of the history of the church, we've, we've seen men and women be difference makers. People like David Livingston, who years ago came out of England to be a missionary and a difference maker in Africa. David Livingston went to Africa to open up areas of commerce and ultimately to open up inroads for Christianity among the African people. When David Livingston first went to Africa, he went by himself. There, there, there were a few supporting him, but he had a deep sense of calling that God was sending him to this place to make a difference for him. David Livingston said, so powerfully convinced am I that it's the will of the Lord that I should go to Africa, that I will go no matter who opposes me. And to Africa, David Livingston went. And he began to make an incredible difference. He did indeed open up roads of commerce and he ultimately opened up pathways to gospel engagement, to Christianity. And, and God began to bless his ministry, but it came slowly over the course of many, many, many years. And he still lacked a lot of support coming out of England. On one occasion, a, a reporter named Henry Morton Stanley went to Africa to try to find David Livingston to report on his progress. People were so intrigued that this man would give up so much in London to go to Africa and dedicate his life there. And so, and so Mr. Stanley went to Africa and he tracked down David Livingston and he spoke the now famous words when he came across him, Dr. Livingston, I presume. <laughs> And David Livingston said, yes. And they struck up a conversation and he 
did the interview and actually David Livingston then spent the rest of his life serving the African people and trying to give them the greatest gift the world has ever known, which is salvation in Jesus Christ. Literally, literally, David Livingston gave his life in Africa. Some of his fellow workers came upon him one morning, kneeling at his bed, hands together as he was lying on the bed. They found him literally in a state of prayer as the Lord took him home. His last moment on earth was praying and interceding for the African people. Literally, they found him in a state of prayer at his bedside. And as they began to handle his body and to prepare it for burial, they removed his heart and they buried his heart in the African soil as a symbol of what David Livingston did for the duration of his life. Namely, he gave his heart to the African people. And although his body was transported elsewhere and ultimately buried elsewhere, his heart remained in Africa because that's where he gave his heart and his life for the cause of Christ. David Livingston was a difference maker. And we have seen over the years, right here at Bell Shoals, men and women like David Livingston who have been called overseas to serve the Lord, to give their hearts and their lives in service for the Lord. And, and we have seen time and time and time again how God richly blesses a church community that's so invested in getting this good word of hope and life to all who need it. And, and over the next four weeks, we're gonna celebrate some people in various capacities who are making a difference for Jesus. And I hope you'll be encouraged to make a difference. I hope you'll be encouraged to join this movement of making a difference. I hope you'll be encouraged to do what you can, to give what you can, to pray as you can, to serve as you can, and ultimately to go with us when you can to make a difference for Jesus, not just to our neighbors, but also to the nation. Because listen to me, God has has a heart for the nations. God has a heart for all people. God has a heart to see every single person on earth come to know and embrace his gift of salvation. This is the heart of God. And God has raised you and I up. He has blessed us and he has commissioned us. Because let me show you a powerful truth that we see throughout human history that you and I are blessed to be a blessing, not just to our neighbors, but also to the nations. You and I are blessed to be a blessing to the nations. This has always been the case. This has always been the heart of God. Let me take you all the way back actually to, to the father of the Jewish people. And I wanna show you how it was God's design that this man who became the father of the Jewish people, that he actually not just be a blessing to his immediate family, but that he ultimately be a blessing to every family. We find it in Genesis 12. Let me show you what happens here. The Lord said to Abram, I want you to leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. And here's what God said he would do. He said, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make you famous and you will then be a blessing to others. And I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who treat you with contempt. And literally notice God says, all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. In other words, God doesn't say to Abram, I want you to leave your relatives. I want you to leave your family. I want you to go to a place I'll later like, like reveal to you where you're gonna land, where you're gonna park, where you're gonna raise your family. And then I will be a blessing to you. You can use everything I give you on yourselves. You, 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 you can go wherever you wanna go with my blessing. You, you can just use everything that you have on yourself to bless your family. That's not what God says to Abraham. He says, no, I'm gonna bless your family so that through your family, you bless other families. I'm gonna bless your family to the extent that ultimately through your family, every family of the earth will be blessed. 
And we see this pattern unfold throughout human history, that God blesses us so that we will be a blessing to others. And that was the case with Abraham. Abraham was raised up, called out, sent out to be a blessing to the nations. Let me, let, let me give another really important takeaway here. You see, God at this point in human history had scattered the nations so that he could reach the nations. See, right before we get to Abraham and his story, what we discover is that mankind was just one people group, just one. Everyone spoke the same language. Everyone liked the same music. Everyone cheered for the same sports team, right? Like, like we were just one, one people, one language. But, but, but there was such pride and arrogance and self-reliance that they had built a tower as tall as they could build it as, as like a tribute to their own power and wisdom. And God said, you know what? If I let this people just remain one people group, they're, they're, they're never gonna look to me for my salvation because they become so self-reliant. And so the scripture says, God looked down on this tower. Notice the irony there. They thought, oh, we're so great, so great, so great. Look how high we build this tower. And God said, that's funny, because I have to look down on it. And God looked down on their, on their little tower and he judged them. And, and he did it by scattering them. He created confusion among their language. They had to scatter out to different places across the known world at the time. And that's why we have various people groups and languages today. And, and you have this where, where now there's a spreading out of people aligned with language so they could understand each other and they began to rebuild communities. And then right after that, here's what God did. God raised up a man. He said, you know what? Through you, all these nations are gonna be blessed. God scattered the nations so that he could reach the nations. He didn't scatter them to judge them so as to never interact with them again. No, I want you to see what happened in Genesis 11 in the Tower of Babel was an act of God's grace. He scattered them so that they would see their need for him. And then after he scattered them, he raised up a man in Abraham and he said, through you, I'm gonna reach them. So that through you and your faithfulness and your resources, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. And so here's what, here, here's what we get to then in, in, in Genesis 17. God actually changed Abram's name. He says, you're no longer going to be called Abram. Instead, you'll be called Abraham because you're going to be the father of a multitude of nations. You're going to be the father of many nations. And, and, and so this is an incredible thing that, that God raised up one to reach the many. In other words, God blessed Abraham so that he could be a blessing to others. And this pattern is played out then through human history. Guess what? God begins to work to reach the nations because God has always had a heart for the nations. This isn't a New Testament idea. This isn't a new idea. No, God has always had a heart for the nations. Let me take you to Psalm 67. May God be merciful and bless us, the psalmist says. May his face smile with favor on us. May your ways be known throughout the earth, your saving power among the people everywhere. May the nations praise you, O God. Yes, may all the nations praise you. Let the whole world sing for joy because you govern the nations with justice and you guide the people of the whole world. May the nations praise you, O God. May the nations praise you and then the earth will yield its harvest and God, our God, will richly bless us. Us. Yes, God will bless us and people all over the world will fear him for the whole earth will acknowledge the Lord and return to him and all the families of the earth will bow down before him for royal power belongs to the Lord and he rules all nations. The Lord loves the nations. He loves every people group. He loves every single person. It's always been God's heart to reach the nations and he blesses us just like he blessed Abraham so that we might be a blessing to others. Check out Psalm 22, excuse me, Psalm 46. 
Be still and know that I am God, the scripture says. Some of you know that verse, but look what comes after it. I will be honored by every nation. Hey, be still and know that God is God. He's the one who rules and reigns with royal power and he's ruling and reigning in such a way that every single nation will honor him and he will be honored throughout the whole world. Psalm 72, may the king's name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun shines. May all the nations be blessed through him and bring him praise. Psalm 86, the nations, all the nations you made will come and bow before you, Lord, and they will praise your holy name. Isaiah 49, he says, you will do more than restore the people of Israel to me. I will also make you a light unto the Gentiles and you will bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Do you get it? Do you get it? Do you get it? Our God has a heart for the nations, all peoples. Yes, all peoples. God loves the world. And he blesses us so that we will be a blessing to the nations. He scattered us so he could reach us. That's the plan and the purpose of God. And therefore, here's what we learn. That the true children of Abraham are not an ethnic people. It's a spiritual people. The true children of Abraham then are people who come to God through saving faith, people who acknowledge their sin, people who acknowledge their desperate need for God, who ask for his forgiveness based on what Messiah has accomplished for us. We now know that's Jesus of Nazareth, who ask for his forgiveness and who live for him all the days of their lives. Let me show you what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 7. The real children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God. What was God ultimately saying to Abram in, in, in Genesis 12? He was saying, you see all these nations scattered? I'm gonna raise you and your family up and I'm gonna bless you, not, not to be an end unto yourself. I'm gonna bless you so that you're a blessing literally to the world and, and the world the nations will hear of my love, my grace, my goodness, my mercy, and they will come to me. And thus, this mighty nation of Abraham is a spiritual nation. It's not an ethnic nation. Every single person who comes to Jesus in saving faith is a son or a daughter of Abraham. And through Abraham, even today, all the nations of the earth are still being blessed. That's why we sing at Vacation Bible School. Do you remember this? Father Abraham had many sons, many sons. They're Abraham. Okay, okay. I thought I was the only one there for a second. I thought some of you are gonna have to get right with Jesus. You know that, right? And it's like, I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, foot, leg, hand. It gets, it's a long song. I don't recommend you sing it because it'll never leave your head, and then you'll never come back to church, okay? So... <laughs> Father Abraham had many sons. What do, we, what, what, what do we see here? Well, we see God has a heart for the nations and he's raised up Abraham so that through him, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. We now see people of every tribe, tongue, and nation hearing, responding to this good news. And by the way, you and I are testimonies. Literally, we are testimonies that God loves people who are far from him. Because you and I are the Gentiles that God said he would reach. We are the sons and daughters of Abraham by faith that God promised to reach. You and I right here today, sitting here today, watching online today, are living testimonies that God loves the nations and that his heart is to reach all peoples in all places at all times. And so here's how you and I play a part in this. Listen to me. Our mandate then is just to continue the mission of making disciples of all nations. This has always been the heart of God. It's undeniable. Not a new idea, not a New Testament idea. It's always been God's heart to reach the nations. And then Jesus made it super simple for us, all right? Sometimes I learn slowly. Can anybody else relate to that? All right, good. For all of us kind of slow learners, let me make it simple for us. You ready? I love this about Jesus. Here's what he said. He came and said to his disciples, I have been given authority in heaven and on earth. In other words, I, I have all authority and power. Therefore, check this out. Go and make disciples of all nations. Even I can understand that. <laughs> Jesus gave us a mandate and a mission, did he not? And what is it? 
to make disciples of the nations. Our neighbors and the nations. I love that Jesus made it so simple. I think Jesus was talking to me. I think Jesus could have said, hey, dummy, just in case you get all bogged down with everything you got going on in life, let me just remind you that I have all authority in all things. There is no person or power greater than me. And so I've given you a mission and a mandate that hello is unstoppable. And so just join me in the mission and Utilize what you have and where you live to make a difference for me and be about making disciples of all nations. That's what I'm telling you to do. Therefore, our mission and our mandate is more about our willingness to do what Jesus has told us to do than anything else. Will we join him? It's, in other words, it's not an issue, do we have clarity? Jesus has given us clarity. We have a whole record of human history as well as the record of God's word to show us. He has a heart for the nations. He blesses us that we might be a blessing to others. And so what is our highest privilege to carry out the mission and the mandate that God has entrusted to us? That's why we're here. And so I want you to understand, not, not every single one of us are called to full-time ministry and missions. That's not God's plan. You know what the beauty of the church is? God uses every single one of us where we are with what we have, with what we're good at to make an eternal difference around the world. Isn't that good news? You get to be a part of it. You get to be a part of it. It's okay. You're not called to full-time ministry and missions if that's not call, God's calling on your life. But I tell you what, you, 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 you can give and you can pray and you can go and you can serve and you can make a difference. Some of you, and this is what I'm praying, some of you may be sensing a call to serve in some unique way full time. Maybe God is raising up, this is my prayer, God is raising up another generation to come out of Bell Shoals that is gonna serve in full time ministry and mission. It can't be all of us, but it needs to be some of us. And all of us have a part to play. Jesus gave this mission to every single one of his followers, not a select few. Every single one of us have a role to play and every single one of you, I just want you to understand the joy of this. Every single one of you can make a difference. And let me show, show you how quickly, just check this out. We, we see it then in, in the goal of all of this, which is God's glory manifested to all peoples and all nations. You, you play a part in this. Every dollar you give, every season of prayer for our ministries or missionaries, every trip you take, right? Every letter you write of encouragement and support. Listen, it, it's making a difference. Every time you share your story with someone in your proximity that you work with or go to school with or hang out with, listen, I'm saying every single thing you do to be a blessing to others is in fulfillment of the mandate and the mission that Jesus gave us. I want you to understand it's gonna culminate in the praise of his glorious grace for all eternity. God's using you. And one day, here's what we have to look forward to. Let me show you Revelation 5. One day we will sing a new song with these words. Singing to Jesus now, you are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it because you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people for God. From where? Every tribe, language, and people and nation. Revelation 7, John says, looking at the eternal kingdom. After this, I saw a vast crowd too great to count from every nation, tribe, and people and language standing in front of the throne and before the lamb and they're clothed in white robes and they held palm branches in their hands and they shouted with a great roar, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the lamb. People from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every language, all those language groups that were formed, all those ethnic groups that were formed. God raised up one, said, I'm gonna bless you to be a blessing to them. And now for thousands of years, guess what? God is proving to be a blessing to them. And he's doing it right now in 2021 through you and me. So that one day, Bell Shoals, listen to me, one day, I fully believe that we will meet people around the throne as we work and serve for Jesus and enjoy time together. We will meet people who say, oh, you were a part of the Bell Shoals family? Thank you for sending out missionaries. Thank you for supporting the work. Thank you for praying for the work. Thank you for going on that trip because I'm here because of what you have done. Just think about that. 
You don't have to be the one who goes full-time. You don't, you don't have to be one who's called to full-time ministry and missions. But when you get involved to make a difference, God multiplies your generosity. He multiplies your prayers. He multiplies your investment. And one day we'll be gathered around the throne with people from every tribe, tongue, language, and nation. Some of whom were brought to salvation through our efforts. I mean, how cool is that? It really is the highest privilege we have to make a difference for King Jesus among our neighbors and to the nations. To think that you and I can live for something bigger than ourselves, be a part of something, making a difference for eternity is overwhelming. The fact that God allows us to be on his team is just the highest privilege. Especially to those of us who were picked last on the kickball team in the seventh grade. Let me just tell you something. I don't know how God does this because he's God and I'm not, but somehow he picks us all at the same time. <laughs> like there's no run of the litter with God. Isn't that good news? There's no, I was picked last. No, you know, you, you know, what, you know what there is? There's only, there's only, you're a son or a daughter. And in either case, you're a part of the family of God. And in his kind providence, he's brought you to the greatest church in the history of the world, Bell Shoals. <laughs> okay, I can't verify that, but it, we're, I love where we are. And, and, and seriously, and, and he's put you here right now. He's put you here right now. Listen to me for such a time as this. He's brought you here right now to make a difference for him. To your neighbors and to the nations. Let me tell you something. We're gonna start going again. We haven't stopped supporting our missionaries. We haven't stopped supporting our missionaries. But we're about to get up on out of here and start going again. And in the years to come, you, you, you're gonna hear tremendous opportunities to go, to give, to serve, to pray, to encourage, and make a difference. And I'm telling you, God will bless that more richly than you can ever imagine. Because this is his heart. And I'm grateful for the David Livingstons. I'm grateful for the Jim Elliots. And I'll tell you who else I'm thankful for. Jeff and Cindy Womble. And the Womble family who some of you are gonna meet here in just a moment, but they're a family called out of Bell Shoals to serve the Lord overseas and to make a difference for him. And oh, how they have made a difference. Let's watch their story together. We met uh, in the college and career department here at Bell Shoals. I don't really remember from that, I remember um, from my mom trying to set us up. I think what brought us together so quickly was because we both felt called to missions and to overseas work. And um, we had had that talk on our second date. And I just said, Cindy, what do you think about missions? And she said something like, I'm called, but was hoping not to go alone. And I said, well, I'm called. It was on a Sunday morning, and I brought flowers to the church. He called me up to the altar, and I'm standing up on the stairs, and he handed me the, the bouquet of flowers and asked me to marry him. After a month of dating, I, I, I was kind of a little bit shocked. At first she said, let me think about it, and then she said, yes, yes, yes. Are you saying yes? Yes, I'm saying yes. <laughs> it was scary at first to be called to missions. I felt called to work with Muslims and knowing that could be dangerous, but in a world religion class, over a billion Muslims that um, are religious and are hoping that they'll go to heaven because of their works, 
And I just thought that's a lot of people that aren't going to go to heaven without Jesus. And so somebody's got to tell them. Learning a different language was a, <laughs> was a challenge. Um, but that also, you know, brought me in contact with my neighbors who I had to rely on. I remember one time being discouraged, and but Cindy said, how many people have you shared the gospel with? And I started naming these guys off, and there was, at that time there was about 12 guys. And I had shared with them over tea, so face to face, shared with them, and many times, um, more than once. And Cindy said, if we weren't here, who's gonna share with all those people? We were able to serve there without any incident for three years and just the people got into our hearts and they were so so hospitable and uh, they they I think they taught me more than I taught them but I did notice bin Laden calendars in almost every shop this was pre 9-11 but he was um, a figure there started reading the paper to try to get a feel for the culture and there were, would be articles in there saying that we were infidels and kill Americans and British and take their stuff. But the first term before 9-11, the people were very open and hospitable. Um, but it was building, that stuff was building underneath. Now we're in Islamabad, the capital, where they're reporting on the war on terror. We thought that was safer than where we were, about three hours north of there. And um, one of the benefits of being there was the International Church. It was about 400 yards from the U.S. Embassy. It's a Western-type church building, um, and we normally sit, come in the store and go up to the front on the right. but because we were running late, we didn't want to go up front. We kind of scooted into the back, more middle section. They do the worship, and then they release the children, and they can go downstairs to um, Children's Church. Luke, my youngest, and, and uh, Emily, they jumped up, and they said, come on, Samuel. They said, we can go, and they're ready to go. And Samuel says, I have a stomach ache, and I'm not, I'm not going to go. I'm going to stay. And so the two, two of my children went downstairs, and um, Samuel was sitting in the middle between Cindy and I. And then as the preacher is about finished with his sermon, I hear pop, pop, pop. We heard some commotion and I turned and looked and this guy had come in and he had grenades strapped to his, to his um, chest. And he had a, a string and he pulled all the pins at the same time. And when he dropped them, they landed on the tile and so we can sort of hear that. We thought it was fireworks so we didn't know what it is. So I look over and and um, he starts throwing those grenades. And the first one was up towards the piano where we normally sat. And then I saw him throw one in our section. And it was um, maybe about 10 rows. We were in um, folding chairs and about 10 rows in front of us. And I just threw out my arm and said, get down. And then I covered over the top of Cindy. But we both thought that we we're gonna die. The last blast happened. I'm laying flat on my face and my glasses are broken. It was very, very smoky and smoggy in there and screaming. And I'm six or eight feet away from Cindy. I had to stand up and walk back over to check on her. I could see she had a, a large hole in the, in the back of her thigh. And he comes over and he goes, where's Samuel? I can't see Samuel. And then I heard this whimper and he was thrown like 15 feet and he was laying and there was a chair laying down and his, his neck was over the chair. And I walked over to him and there was a big uh, spot of blood on the carpet. When I picked him up, I saw that he was wounded in the back of his head. He had two, two holes in the back of the head and I picked him up and I just said, Samuel, um, a terrible person has did this, but God is with us. They got like six men to pick me up and take me out, which some of those men I hadn't seen before. Sometimes I think there were some angels in there. Samuel was the most serious with the brain injuries. Cindy had the most pain because of the most um, surgeries, like maybe seven surgeries. I looked the worst. 
but I was all right. Samuel had um, shrapnel wounds from the, his head all the way to his feet. So they like had to do minor surgery on him almost every day when they would go to change his, his dressings and his uh, band-aids and stuff. And so before we left, the doctor said, he's young enough to, his brain will rewire. And except the scars, I mean, he's healed. But he said, you know, I have a piece of shrapnel in my arm. And he said, uh, people get tattoos. He says, I don't really need a tattoo because I can just feel this piece. And he says, I know that God saved my life and he has a purpose for my life. All I have to do is feel that shrapnel in my arm. Samuel is married to a wonderful girl, Marissa, and they live in Kansas City. He's gonna get a PhD in biblical counseling, and he's an intern at uh, Midwestern Seminary. He still loves missions, so he wants to do missions. He, he doesn't know exactly how that's gonna look, but he has a heart for missions. A verse that we just held on to was, God says, I'm an ever-present help in times of trouble. And when the trouble happened, God was there. He healed us. He healed us in more than the physical sense. He healed us uh, mentally and spiritually. I look back and I think we were so close. As a family, we were, we were so close. I was speaking in a church in Tampa, and the pastor asked me a question, something about what's the greatest thing you've seen God do in your family since you've been overseas? And I had to think about it, and I said, you know, when Cindy and I went out, we were two missionaries. But I said, now we're six missionaries. And I said, I think our children will do a better job than we do. Yes, God called the Womble family to forsake all and trust him in Pakistan. But he's calling all of us to do that daily because he wants so much more for us than what this life is. He may not call you to go across the seas, but he's calling you to go next door or across the street. Jesus said, Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So I used to train and say, if you're not, if you're not fishing, then you're not following very closely. You know, so there's a lot of fishing that we need to do. Bell Shoals, would you join me in welcoming the Womble family this morning? So glad you guys are here. Um, thank you for sharing your story with us. Uh, this is Jeff and Cindy and Samuel and Marissa, and we have the rest of the Womble crew here, and uh, we also have mom and dad here, uh, Cindy's parents, and Jeff's mother was with us uh, in the first service, and so we're just so honored uh, to have you with us today, your entire family. Such a blessing, and, and thanks again for sharing your story with us. Cindy, it's it's uh, been quite a ride, <laughs> but uh, I've cried every single time I've watched that video. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just, I'm just overwhelmed by God's kindness to you and his, his faithfulness to you all. And I, I know that you grew up here. Uh, you all met here, as you said, and, and we've kind of been on this journey together in many respects. So T tell us just what it's meant to be connected to Bell Shoals and, and how important it is um, to have a home church that's praying and supporting and encouraging because in, in my view, that's the most important piece of the puzzle. We couldn't be over there doing what we were doing without the prayers and the support of the people here. And um, prayer is the greatest support. And yeah. you all have prayed for us. There have been times Many times we've been over on the field and we've sent a prayer request back to the prayer warrior room here that they, they're faithful prayer, prayer warriors here that pray. There have been ladies that I've um, walked with when I've been back on stateside, they've sent us care packages and uh, just the support and then the knowing that we have a place to stay when we come back. Yeah. Um, so you all have played that big part we couldn't be there and do what we did without you all. Yeah. And Jeff, it, it all began many years ago 
with, uh, I guess you kind of walking in as a hot shot thinking you could date her for a month and then propose. <laughs> so one month, you, and uh, I love that you put her on the spot on a Sunday morning. So, you know, at church, on the stage, and uh, I mean, who could possibly say no uh, in that scenario? But uh, it's really cool how the Lord brought you guys together here and then, you know, sent you out. But that was such a vital part even of your relationship, wasn't it? That, that missions piece. So talk to us about that. Yeah. Well, I remember I was working at Sherwin-Williams in Tampa and coming home one day, when I was at Sherwin Williams, I'd have my quiet time in the morning, a verse that stood out, I'd write it on an index card, put it in my pocket, and I'd memorize it during the day while I'm at work, just trying to keep my focus on the Lord throughout the day. And I was coming home and got in a traffic jam from Tampa to Brandon. And at, at that moment, God just brought that verse, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, then it can bear much fruit. And there was a struggle. I remember hitting my steering wheel, you know, and, and frustrated. But God was calling me to surrender everything to him. If I hadn't done that, then this wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Because Cindy was, she's been our rock. She's been the rock of our family. Just strong, just strong faith. Sometimes I'm a little emotional, but she is uh, really strong. So um, we're, we're dating. And I asked her one night at her parents' house, I said, what do you feel about missions? And she says, I'm called. I don't want to go alone. And when <laughs> I said, well, I was called. I was called at Clearwater Christian College. Um, so you don't have to go alone. <laughs> <laughs> so I swooped right in. And, and, uh, right. No, I thought it would be hard to find somebody yep. that would leave America and go work with Muslims in Pakistan. You know, I, I just thought that would be difficult. But Debbie Wiseman had said, well, Cindy just got back from three months in India. So you should check her out. <laughs> yes, know? yes. And then, of course, Frankie. And um, when we got to, to Pakistan, all the young people, they'd say, hey, was yours a love marriage or an arranged marriage? And we would say 50-50. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Parents <laughs> supportive. And, of course, you guys love each other. So, no, that, that's uh, just amazing. It's, it's neat to see how just at the right time the Lord brought you together and then, and then sent you out. And one, one of the things I've heard you all talk about is, you know, coming through that, that terrorist attack, and the Lord was in complete control. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we highlight in your story that there was a grenade that went into a section where you would have normally sat mm -hmm. if you weren't running late that day. And then one of the things that was not in that feature is a grenade that actually rolled right next to you that did not go off. Mm -hmm. And you put all that together and what you see is that from the very beginning of your relationship until now, God's got a plan for you and he's in complete control. And I just love your testimony that, you know, at the end of the day, all of us, our, our lives are hidden in Christ. Mm -hmm. We are not citizens of this earth. So mm -hmm. um, just give us some perspective on that. I just love your story related to, you know, you come to Jesus, um, mm -hmm. you lose your life in him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought God reminded me this morning that in the end times, and we're in the end times, they overcame Satan. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they didn't shrink back their lives even from death. So you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses. We have a testimony and we don't shrink back no matter what. And so God has our lives. We have eternal life. We're already crucified with Christ and have eternal life in us. So there's no reason to fear. And our, when I would go back to Pakistan, I was much more bold after the attack than I was before the attack. Yeah, I find that so interesting. You, you've said that after the attack, you had less fear than prior to, which is pretty cool. I saw how God protected our lives. And I said, if that's his, our hands are, uh, our lives are in his hands. And so his will will be done. If he wants to protect us, he'll continue to protect us. If he wants us home, he'll take us home. But there's no fear in the song we sang this morning, no fear in death. Because that's right. we have eternal life. Mm, that's we such, know our future. Such a good word. No, that's such a good word. Mm -hmm. that, that gets us to Samuel. <laughs> and, um, and certainly God spared your life that day. And I know you had a long recovery period as a child. And, and even today still have that shrapnel in your arm as a reminder of God's faithfulness and revision. And here you are now um, preparing for a life on mission, which I just think is the most incredible thing 
in terms of God bringing the Womble story full circle is you have a group of people who in hate try to take your life and now you're gonna spend the rest of your life trying to give them eternal life. And, um, and so we're honored to have you and Marissa here, Samuel. Tell us how God's worked in your life to bring about that calling and where you are now uh, preparing for that. Yeah, so when we came back to the States, um, I remember telling my dad shortly after the terrorist attack, I was called to medical missions. And um, just, just seeing his, his plan unfold, um, went to nursing school where Marissa and I met and um, just didn't know what I wanted to do on the mission field. And I'm um, studying um, at Midwestern in Kansas City, uh, right. the seminary there in biblical counseling. And um, it just clicked. That's, that's what I, I feel God wants us to do is to use the word of God for, for the people that, uh, the problems that people face. And yeah. so with, with missionaries, um, while we're here in the States, we're gonna be joining a church plant here in 2023. Um, right. at a part in the south of Kansas City where um, there's not a whole lot of healthy churches. And so we don't know what God will do with, for us um, in the long term. We definitely have a heart for the, mission, the, for the nations. Um, but yeah, in the short term, we, we want to honor this call and um, be discipling those in, in our communities. Yeah, and, and as, as Cindy said, you know, the greatest need for our missionaries is the need for encouragement, support, prayer. Um, it is very, very difficult. Uh, I love the part in the feature where your dad talks about a season of discouragement and your mom saying, no, how many people have heard the gospel mm -hmm. because you've been here? And, and so the fact that you're preparing to bring counseling, encouragement, specialized training to, to our missionaries and potentially even go to yourself is, is incredible. There's such a great need for that. Um, Marissa, you've kind of come into this story now, um, being connected to Samuel and the Wombles. And, and, uh, and I don't know if you realize this, but when you when you, when you kind of embrace the Womble family, you embrace the whole Bell Shoals family. <laughs> so we're kind of all part of your family now, whether you like it or not. <laughs> and um, so we expect Christmas gifts um, <laughs> and we'll get you a list. But um, it's an honor to have you. It's neat to see how God brought you and Samuel together. So tell us how we can be praying for, for the two of you while you're in this season of preparation at seminary and, um, and then even beyond. Um, so a really um, good way to be praying for us is as we're um, working with the other people um, that we'll be church planning with in 2023, um, just making sure that we find the perfect place for us um, and that we're able to um, reach our community really well um, yeah. where we're at. And then ultimately that um, God will reveal to us what his calling is for us after this church plant. And um, where we're supposed to be next after Kansas City. Absolutely. Well, we will be praying to that end for you both. Mm -hmm. And um, again, we're just so, so grateful for your whole family. Um, and, and Samuel, again, just hearing your story today, your calling. Um, we, we've actually been working behind the scenes with some of our friends at Midwestern Seminary. Um, President Allen, along with um, Dr. Dusing and Dr. Smith and uh, they've been made aware of your story. They love your story. They don't love it as much as Bell Shoals loves it. Okay, but they, <laughs> they love it. They're supportive of it. And um, so I want you to know today that in an effort to support the two of you, uh, Midwestern is going to cover the remaining cost of your education through the end of this year. Wow. Um, wow. Because they want you to be able to, to finish out this year strong. Okay. And I want to say thank you to our, our dear friends at Midwestern. Um, they, they do. They love you guys, and um, they're, they're on board. And so if you look at your account and you see a zero balance, <laughs> that's not a mistake, okay? Um, and then in addition to that, I want you to know, of course, our, our family loves you. Our Bell Shoals family loves you. And so um, we do. Uh, and so... Because of the generosity of our faith family and our missions team, um, we're going to pay for all remaining costs of your master's program and uh, make sure that you get through your seminary education um, without uh, any debt, any cost, so that you wow. can go into your missions service without that burden. And uh, we want you to know thank that we're you. in it with you too, and we love you. Thank okay? you. So. Uh, thank you. Um, and so we're, we're so excited to partner with you, you. and just to see what the Lord does in the days to come. And we will continue to pray for all of you. Um, so honored um, by how the Lord's used you. You guys are difference makers and you inspire us to be difference makers. 
And it takes a lot of courage to share your story. And it's taken a lot of commitment to the gospel to spend your lives in places like Pakistan. But um, we're gonna meet people one day who say thanks for sending the Wombles and, um, and who are gonna give glory to God because you, you went. And uh, I just wanna say, Cindy, thanks for marrying that guy <laughs> <laughs> after only a month together. Uh, and I, on behalf of your mom and dad, I think they supported that too. So just again, to see how the Lord's used you is, uh, is a great blessing to us. And so one more time, Belshaw, if you would, just thank, thank the Womble family. That is good.